Relationships are gifts from God. Or let me rephrase that better. Good relationships are gifts from God. God made us social beings, meant to interact with each other and living to our fullest potentials on earth until our time is up. The Bible says that two are better than one. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This scripture right here carefully details fundamental elements that make relationships such a beautiful thing. And in this video, I intend to fixate a little bit more on intimate relationships, one with marital and lifetime plans in view. Dear child of God, the Lord Jesus himself told us of one of the most beautiful attributes of God, which is to give good gifts to his children. Matthew 7, 9 to 11. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And one of the greatest gifts of a lifetime is the gift of the right partner. The preacher in Ecclesiastes pointed out that anyone who has no one should be pitied because when they fall, they have no one to help them up. Listen, yes, you may not need to get married to have people who will lift you up when you're down. However, if we're going to be honest, then there are situations when the only person you need at that time is someone you're intimate with. There are situations I may not be okay to make available to you, but with my partner, I can lay it all bare. There are situations where no one can reach you but the one you are intimate with. The Bible says in Genesis 2, 18, 22, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. After the creation of man, God saw there was still a need in him. He was one of a kind, and although God made him to interact with him, he knew that they would not be on equal plane and the man would feel the need sooner or later to interact with someone who is exactly like himself. We all feel that at one point or the other in our lives. Children seem to connect more with friends and peer groups than with older folks. Youth leaders will confirm that young people would rather confide in a leader who can relate with their feelings and experiences. And who better to do this than someone who's in close proximity to them in age, another young person? God knew that Adam would feel that and he felt Adam's need even before Adam did himself. This right here is another display of the nature of God. He loves and cares deeply about you so much that even before you consider something as an issue to bring up before him, he puts it up himself to worry about fixing it. I had the opportunity to talk with a friend some years ago, and while we talked, she lamented about how thieves were doing damage to a particular venture of hers, and she didn't know what to do so she'd resorted to using some desperate means to curb the issue. Then I asked if she'd talked to God about it already, and she said she hadn't because she didn't think God involved himself in this sort of thing. I was quite surprised, but when I asked again if the issue meant something to her, and she said yes, then I said it meant something to God, too. Whatever bothers you bothers him. Why? Because you're his child and he loves you. Luke 12, 6-7 
are not five sparrows sold for two pennies. Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. If you're worth this much to God, then your relationship with the right partner means something to him. And this is not only because he loves you, but because the wrong partner in your life has the power to mess up and destroy many things in your life. That's what God protects you from sometimes when it seems your relationship with them doesn't work. You try all you can, pray as much as you can, read as many books as possible, but somehow it seems God himself is stopping the relationship from succeeding. Don't you think there must be something he's trying to save you from that you might not even be aware of? Surely there must be, for there is no limit to the knowledge, wisdom, and intelligence of the Lord God. He's seen certain things up ahead, and because you loved him and committed the relationship to him, he's fighting for you. Many young believers have locked themselves in situations God didn't prepare for them because they shut God out, closed their eyes and ears to the warning signs, and went all in. Today they may act as if all is well, but they themselves are aware that they're stuck and need rescuing. It's very important, dear believer, to grow in your relationship with God. This relationship builds up your spirit and mind to sense things in the spirit realm and long before their time. It also gives you the ability to see things that are concealed from the physical eyes by deception. This ability is called discernment. I know that many people are given the gift of discernment. Still, every child of God who has the Spirit of God in them has usable measures of this ability as well. You can call it the development of spiritual sense organs, similar to the eyes, ears, nose, and skin, which are spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 15. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. Hence, when a man or a woman comes into your life, you're able to sense the kind of spirits they operate with and their true motives, and you're also able to read the signs and understand their implications in real life and in time. This way, you're able to gain the wisdom needed to leave while you still can, before damage can be done. You see, most people think, well, I'll give it a chance. If it doesn't work, there's always the option of divorce. They fail to understand that there's a good reason God said he hated divorce. One of those reasons why is what divorce did to you. Sure, you can always walk away if you like, but you can't walk away from all the damage that's done to you. And if you've had children already, to them too. But with God's help, you can salvage these experiences before they take place in your life. How? When you let him lead you and direct the course of your relationships with others. So how do you know if God wants you with someone? What will happen if he wants you with that person? First, please understand that many things can happen, some reliable and others not so much. So it's important you know the difference. Here's what'll happen if God wants you with someone. He will bind you two together. This may work with feelings, but feelings will not be the foundation. You may probably not even really like this person in that manner. Yet somehow you discover that they're usually on your mind. You may even find yourself bumping into each other in unplanned situations and places. You may even try as hard as you like and even pray about it, but it will only happen more and more. Sometimes some people may even relocate from a city because of this. However, after some time, something always happens. Either they return or the person they're running from moves to the same environment too and so on. Remember that I said this is not about obsessive or infatuating feelings towards him or her, but a connection orchestrated by God, which, when accepted, can develop into a feeling more intimate. And then one very important, probably the most important on this list, is that God will give you peace with them. One of the signs that you should steer clear off that person is pressure, pressure to sin, to become something or someone God didn't make you to please them, then God, pressure from the fear that you might be doing something wrong, and so on. 
You see, whomever God wants you to be with will keep your mind at peace. They will help you get closer to God. They'll be interested in your potentials and help you develop it. They'll look for means to help you feel loved, safe, and secure. Somehow, you'll feel peace committing yourself to them and their own visions without feeling intrusive or misguided. You'll feel like their mission complements your life's pursuit as well, and you will find fulfillment helping them reach it. It is a beautiful journey to find and be in a God-ordained relationship, my friend. Do not settle for anything less. Do not shut God out of this vital area of your life. He wants to be involved in this area so that in a world filled with darkness, you and the family that will come out of both of you will be the light to shut down the darkness. I pray that you'll get it right in this area when the time comes to be with someone. In Jesus' name, amen. Relationships are one of the greatest gifts of life. Family, friends, loved ones, parents, children, colleagues. Our relationships with people form the beauty of society and community. Through relationships, we are able to find companionship and build togetherness. Through our association with people, we are able to connect with one another, regardless of background, history, race, or social status. Even the Bible, in expressing the power of having someone or people in your life, said in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, Two people are better than one, because they can reap more benefit from their labor. For if they fall, one will help his companion up. But pity the person who falls down and has no one to help him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they can keep each other warm. But how can one person keep warm by himself? Although an assailant may overpower one person, two can withstand him. Moreover, a three-stranded cord is not quickly broken. Furthermore, when God created man in Eden and blessed humanity to multiply all over the earth, he was establishing the essence of community. Man was built to be a social being, to live in community, to communicate, this is why we have eyes to see, ears to hear, feet to move, hands to touch, skin to feel that touch, and so on. You can love yourself, but being surrounded by loving people makes a big difference. You may be able to help yourself many times, but there will be times when you will require the assistance of others, and knowing that they are there to assist you is a great blessing. This was something Jesus realized. That is why he promised his disciples and everyone who believes in him, his ever-present company through the Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see any more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. This is such a beautiful thing, knowing that as you journey through life, facing the turmoil, the heartaches and the storms, the highs and the lows, you will always have someone close to you when no one else can. There are different kinds and levels of relationships we develop along life's journey. The value of each relationship is determined by either the kind of connections we share or by the kind of benefit they bring into our lives. For instance, with or without benefit, because we are connected to family by blood, we share a special connection with our parents and our siblings. No matter how much differences you may have with your family, they are still your family. Nothing can change that fact that the same blood flows through your veins. Though family may abandon you and hurt you, they are still what they are, family. The same goes for your spouse. You see, your spouse shares a bond with you that is both physical, legal, and spiritual. 
In fact, the Bible says that when a man and a woman are properly and legally joined together in marriage, it is God who has joined them together and nobody is permitted to separate that union. It is a union that is binding on earth and in heaven. Mark chapter 10 verses seven through nine says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God is glorified in any relationship that makes us stronger, better, and helps us fulfill His purpose for our lives. Our friends, spouses, acquaintances, and family are amazing additions to our lives. However, dear friend, take note of this very important message today. You must never elevate anyone in your life to that point where you have to beg him or her to stay in your life before they do. A relationship is no longer one when it now feels like a favor done for one party by the other. In the world today, there's a massive desire in the hearts of many people to feel loved, accepted, and wanted. This desire has driven some people to give themselves away, slowly losing sight of their own self-worth until they are reduced to nothing but a tool in the hand of someone who is just there for the fun ride and will toss them off anytime they want. Beloved, you are much more than you think you are. You are not just anybody seeking validation from the world. You are not just one man or one woman seeking to be liked by people. You are more than that. You are the king's kid. Do you not know this? I mean, the monarch of the universe calls you his most prized possession. No one sees in you what he sees, not even you yourself. David, the sweet psalmist once asked in Psalms 8 verses 3 through 6, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. You might as well put your name right there, dear saint. You are so special to him. He calls you a chosen generation. He calls you royalty, a royal priesthood. He calls you a holy nation. The Lord God Almighty looks on you and calls you a very peculiar, special, unique, and amazing soul. This is who you are. Do you now see that reducing yourself to seeking validation from one person who is here today and gone tomorrow does a great injustice to who God says you are? Now, I do not deny that you will not always be right in your relationship choices or in your dealings with people that God will bring into your life. Some people come into your life to fulfill God's purpose in you and for you. They may end up leaving because you fail to see that purpose or even appreciate it at the time. Maybe because you don't know so much or you are still unwise and not mature at the time. As you grow, you can learn to appreciate people in life much more. As you grow, you can learn to love people rightly. As you mature, you will learn to bring peace and healing to people that God has brought into your life. Placing value and appreciating people that God brings into your life. Acknowledging your limitations and weaknesses. Acknowledging when you are wrong and have messed up. Humbling yourself to learn and grow from them is a great way to sustain good relationships and become great yourself. However, Every person that comes into your life has a time, a season, and a purpose. One of the greatest disasters you can bring into your life as an individual is to keep a relationship for long with someone meant to be in your life only for a short while. Over time, such a relationship will become a burden, a ticking time bomb waiting to explode and destroy stuff in your life. The same thing happens with a relationship meant to be for a long term being cut short because it doesn't meet your desired speculations. Dear friend, sometimes God's best does not always come in the most beautiful packages. Not knowing the difference between the kinds of relationships that are in your life 
or how to manage them will bring more loss to your life than gain. Therefore, my friend, if or when people choose to leave your life at any time in your life, especially when you know you didn't do anything that displeases God, please let them go. There is only one relationship in your life that you cannot do without, your relationship with God. If and when any other relationship ends, as long as you can confirm that it is not the result of your bad attitude hurting a good soul in your life, but rather a threat, a desire to replace God in your life, to diminish your value and worth, to make you chase after them as if your life depended on it, let them go. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. People can choose to leave your life for different reasons. You need to understand this, my friend. Some people will leave because they can no longer manipulate you like they used to. Some people will leave when you start standing up for yourself speaking up against their behavior and demands of you that has been wronged. Some people will walk away when they can no longer mess around with your life. Some will leave when they find new prey. Some might leave because they find someone they believe is better than you. Like I said, you are not perfect. God doesn't even say you are. However, you are not going to remain the way you are as long as you walk in the light of what God has said concerning you, growing in His grace and mercy. What you need in your life right now is not someone who sees you for who you've been all along, but who will dare to see you for who you can be. That's what you need in your life, my friend. You don't need another friend who wants to hang out and waste your time and destiny on trivial things. You don't need another friend who just wants to blend in with the world and who gets offended when there is even the slightest mention of standing out. You need the right people in your life. I will say that again. You need the right people in your life. You need people who push you closer to God, closer to destiny, closer to righteousness and holiness. You need people who will love you for who you are and invite you patiently to become who you are meant to be. Therefore, when one who cannot do this, who doesn't see this, decides to leave, let them go. God will remove some people from your life in order to plant the right ones. Sometimes he will remove them in order to create room. Therefore, instead of crying because someone left you or because someone disappointed you, rejoice, my friend. Celebrate and consider their departure a deliverance from whatever might have happened if they weren't removed from your life. I encourage you to grow in your spiritual life through prayer, studying the Bible and fellowshipping with other God-fearing Christians. This has a way of empowering and growing your spiritual senses. It is called discernment. Through discernment, you will know who should be in your life and who shouldn't. Through discernment, you will understand what God would want you to handle a relationship that is showing up in your life. Through discernment, you will be able to read the signs that some is meant to stay and others are meant to leave. And you can have this discernment by the help of the Holy Spirit in you. That, however, will be the outcome of a very sensitive and developed spirit inside of you. Draw closer to God today, my friend. Your heavenly Father wants to guide you and protect you from the troubles of this life. It is time to start listening to Him and knowing Him, understanding when He speaks or acts, and following Him accordingly. The disease of worry and anxiety is a cruel killer in our world today. So many are plagued on all sides with abundant reasons to faint and lose heart. So many are pressed strongly on all sides that they begin to lose hope that they could survive this or overcome it at all. People are so besieged by fear of the future, near future, and the unknown that it poisons and ultimately suffocates their today. Living in the now sounds like a far-fetched tale of foolish rambling from people who are careless and irresponsible about their lives, 
and the attending situations of the life they find themselves in. This acidic and toxic fear completely kills whatever hope many have for tomorrow, forgets many in the past, and roots till it buries even more in the decision of today, effectively terminating their hope, hence their lives. And so you find very young and vibrant men and women who are completely buried by the realities they find themselves in. So worried that they begin to age extremely quickly. They age so quickly because of worry of problems and situations in life. This is a sad reality in our world today. Is this your tale also? Are you well seated in a journey to a short-lived existence because of anxiety, fear, doubt, and hopelessness? Then this is God's very deliverance for you. God wants to save you from the harsh conditions of hopelessness and fretting. God wants to bring you, yes, even you, out of the pit of struggling alone and scheming your way to the future you hope to get to. God wants to permanently place you far above the confirms of this struggle. God wants to be your rock and hope and standby. Matthew 6, 25 through 28, King James Version. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Jesus, the Son of God, walked this earth and had to live and face the diverse issues of life same as every one of us. He too had a need to eat, he too had the need for clothing, to care for his parents and beloved disciples. The Bible recorded that at one point in time, he was so sad that he cried, heartbroken by the death of his dear friend Lazarus. He was every bit as human as any single one of us. He felt betrayed and was pushed to his death by one of his most trusted ones. Under the heavy hand of agony and pain, he prayed in the garden till the very sweat from his body was as thick as blood. Jesus knew pain like every one of us. He knew firsthand what disappointment tasted like. He was bruised and hurt for crimes he knew nothing of. In the end, he was dragged, insulted, stoned, and crucified by the very ones he has poured out his heart in healing, delivering, and teaching for the better of his ministry here on earth. So when this same person says not to worry, it is worth listening to. He said very clearly in his word to you and to me not to fall into the popular trend of worry and fretting. And yes, it is popular. So many people go around life carrying the whole burden of the world on themselves, going about life with a very heavy attitude, constantly pushing their health and well-being to the limit by trying to solve all the problems of the world. God does not want that for you. He has something so much better than concern and stress for you. He has made a roadmap that brings so much peace and joy ultimately for all who will but believe and give themselves wholly to this way and trust in Him absolutely. And like every other blessing of God, it is of the highest that you believe in God. Having faith that what He said He will do is exactly what He will do that faith then provokes you to do your part in trust that God cannot lie and is faithful to bring to pass all that He has said concerning you and your loved ones. What then is the requirement? Hands of worry and concern luggage. In the world today, many people cannot even begin to conceive the idea that they are expected to live as though it does not matter, to live without a worry in the world to absolutely go about life as though someone else had it all worked out for them. To many in the modern world, it is just a display of outright negligence and irresponsibility to behave in this manner. 
That's where the tricky stuff is, dear son of God. It is in the details. God did not ask you to wake up and go about life carelessly and recklessly, as though life does not matter. He is definitely not asking you to whistle your way in life in supreme reckless abandon with no connection to anything whatsoever. No. God is not saying to not sit and plan your ways and agenda. He is not telling you to abandon the ship of your life and sleep and lazy off on the deck in complete irresponsibility. No. Now God is not also saying that you should go about with a weight on your life permanently with you, trying to figure out everything, trying to plan for all possibilities to better equip your fail-proof plan. He is definitely not asking you to hold desperately unto the wheel of your life and lose sight of Him and everything else because you want to make meaning through the success of your life. No. He is asking you to believe the truth in Him. He is asking you to hang all your hope and faith on Him alone, having made your adequate preparations. He is saying that He wants to help you take care of the ship, both on deck and from the seas. He wants to bring the wind to your sails. He wants to calm the waves to give you a hitch-free ride. He wants to deal with the sea turbulence for you when you have no way of helping yourself. He wants you to trust and hope in Him alone and not trust in the arm of flesh. Psalm 18, 1 through 3, King James Version. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. God wants your trust in Him and Him alone. Now quite a number of people out there go around mouthing off how they love God and trust Him and believe in Him Sadly, this is not true. The truth will always be reflected in what you do. If you really trust in God, you will do what the Word of God says, dear one. God was very clear in His Word and is not about to change His mind on the subject. He does not do as men normally behave. He does not have a review season of His almighty policies and Word. He does not go about changing what He has said for anyone because of the times and seasons that have become peculiar. No, God's Word is sure on the subject. He made it painfully clear through the first scripture that we read. Worry about absolutely nothing. Do not fret and be fearful. God is telling you to calm down in the ship. He has the storm covered. He had the waves under leash. The winds may blow from now till next week, but so what? God has them in His able pocket and is not about to lose control of them. God does not sleep. He is permanently seated on the throne in heaven, administering all things. Now He is awake every day, all day of your life to give you a permanent and unyielding advantage. He is awake so you can sleep. When the others are busy getting heightened blood pressure over the issue, calm all the way down in absolute faith in God. He has got your back. Other people might not be able to boast of anyone who is so committed to the full success of their lives and destinies and go all out to help them stand out from the crowd of hustlers and the struggling mass. But you can. You have the Almighty God on your side. He has said, hey, I got this. Take the load off and come to me. I will help you carry that load. Mine is lighter. Take mine and carry it instead. God, in all his wisdom, created the whole earth and all that is in it, the birds, fishes, and all. The birds have no storage facility somewhere in the sky where they can administer managerial skills and skillfully plan their survival on their struggles and plots through their life. No, God is so faithful to the detail that even the most seemingly worthless bird is well planned for in his grand strategy of things. He watches over them faithfully and is fully aware of their dealings. The same is true for every other creature out there. The diversity of the myriad of millions of discovered species of animals out there 
and even the tremendous number of undiscovered ones all depend on the Lord for their sustenance and existence. All these years, He has always remained faithful and kept them. You, dear Son of God, very child, you are so much more precious to Him than the millions upon millions of animal species out there. Your worth to Him can truly not be calculated at all. He desires to have you truly hope completely in Him. He never forgot you and never will forget you. He has your best interest at heart. He is vividly in control over the affairs and swells of life. His plan is to have you surf through it all as you lay in His able arms, no matter the storm and season of life you are in or will ever encounter. Jesus wants you to know that He, the Almighty God, is on your ship with you as you sail through life. He is there with you right now. Yes, even now. He is watching over your care more than a father, a mother, can ever do. More faithfully than a lover can ever do also. Jesus has the best plans for you. The only requirement? Trust absolutely in only the Lord God and depart once and for all from worrying and fretting. Do you know that thanksgiving is the only thing God cannot do for himself? God possesses all powers greater than any power we have seen or experienced before. He is a God who dwells above everything and everyone else and beyond time as it is. In all this majesty and power, in all his creation and grandeur, God still cannot glorify in himself. He cannot praise himself. The glory of God comes from the thanksgiving of his creations. When God does something in your life and you go ahead to return the glory and the thanks to him, you have done that which he cannot do for himself. Have you considered what the Bible says about the creation of mankind in the Bible? Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. The reason for your existence is to glorify your creator. Thanksgiving is the vehicle through which glory is conveyed. The glory of God is only carried to him on the premises of thanksgiving. When you do not thank God for his doings, you deprive him of his glory which he has said he will never share with any man. When you deny God thanksgiving, you are inadvertently confirming to the heavens that whatever good thing has just happened to you was on the back of your own strength. You are basically dueling heaven for the glory of God. The only thing God is more jealous of, aside from his creations, which are I and you, is his glory. God is a jealous God when it comes to his children and his glory. The glory of God is for his own keeps. You pit yourself against God when you deny him thanksgiving, which glorifies him. Never allow yourself to get to that point where your heart starts to tell you that you are sufficient in yourself. When you begin to think that your winning and survival are due to your calculations, you have decided to pit yourself against the power that sustains you. And before you know what or how, you find yourself broken and back on the level where you first started, before God lifted you. Many men have had to be reminded by God when they dared to take his glory. Why do you need to thank God every day? What happens when you thank God? Thanksgiving is a roller coaster in the spiritual realm. A chain of reactions is started in the spiritual realm when a man is engaged in thanksgiving. A thankful man lives a life of ease and unwarranted abundance. But what happens when you thank God? You open the channel for other blessings that you didn't even ask for. King Solomon woke up one morning 
and decided that it was time for him and the whole world of Israel to return and offer thanksgiving to God. He made a show of it, openly slaughtering a thousand animals in thanks to God. In the book of 2 Chronicles 1, verse 6, Solomon went up to the bronze altar before the Lord in the tent of meeting and offered a thousand burnt offerings in it. That night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. When Solomon performed that historic act before the bronze altar of God, he opened the channel for a blank check. God gave him the opportunity to handle all his affairs that night just because he thanked God. So when you thank God daily, you avail yourself of opportunity to handle every other issue in your life. Solomon went to give God thanks for a particular reason, but on the premises of that sacrifice, his other lingering issues became matters for God's urgent intervention. You provoke the presence of God when you engage him in thanksgiving. Psalms 22 verse two says, but you are holy, O you who are enthroned in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. His presence is felt in the thanksgiving of his people. So whenever you open your heart to say thank you to God, you are unlocking the door to his presence where all impossibilities are handled. If your matter can make it into the presence of God, then it is handled. The woman with the issue of blood said, if only she could touch the hem of his garment, I would be made whole. The presence of God is the antidote to every single ailment and disaster. And that presence is carried permanently in the praises of his people. When you thank God daily, you qualify for the renewal of your blessings on a daily basis. People who have cultivated the act of praising God and giving him thanks constantly live permanently on the list for renewal of blessings. Proverbs 3 verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. When you thank God for his fingers, you qualify to see his hands. One of the major reasons for stagnation and circular living amongst the children of God is that we forget that we need to live in perpetual thanksgiving for us to record any meaningful progress in life. I remember as a kid, I would always beg my mother for a football of my own so I could kick about in the yard. Of course, my Nigerian mother would always say no, but one day she came back from the office and I went to her room and thanked her for the notebook she had gotten for me on her way back from the office. Now this is where my eyes opened to this passage we just read. When my mother came downstairs that afternoon, she had my ball in her hands. Now, she had bought the ball at the same time as she did the notebooks, but she wanted to see if I would appreciate the notebooks and that propelled her to give the ball. Knowing my mother, if I hadn't said thank you for those books, she would probably have returned that ball or given it out and made sure I knew why she did that so it is also with God. All your blessings are readily available and packaged in the store of heaven, but you can only access them through the instrumentality of thanksgiving. So when do you thank God? Many times we are faced with so many happenings that we actually forget and overlook the place of thanksgiving. Ignoring the place of thanksgiving is as dangerous as idolatry to God. What do I mean? Many of us forget to return to God in appreciation when the winnings have begun. We become so ecstatic and carried away in the fineness of life and forget how that came about. 
So when do you need to thank God? Thank God when the miracle happens so that it can be completed. Jesus, during his time on earth, encountered 10 men stricken with leprosy, and he was moved in compassion to heal them. He gave instructions to them, and the 10 all went away and got healed of the disease, but only one returned. The rest of the men went about their jubilation and ecstasy and forgot by whom that victory came, save one of them, who returned back to where Jesus was sitting and came back to give him thanks. And the Bible records on the book of Luke, 17, verse 17, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you whole. The man who returned to give Jesus thanks also received wholesomeness in addition to the healing he earlier got. Don't get so carried away that you do not realize that the victory you are celebrating was the doing and expression of the power of God. We earlier said how dangerous it is to forget God after victory because it means you are dragging His glory with Him. Thank God in the midst of problems. Yes, you heard me right. Even in the midst of all the tribulations in your life, thank God. In fact, the best time to thank God is in the midst of the challenges. Do you remember the children of Israel before the mighty, impregnable wall of Jericho? Do you remember what God told them to do in the midst of that situation? He told them to sing, dance, and give thanks to Him. Listen to me, child of God. When you thank God in the midst of the problems, you have consciously invited him into the battle because he inhabits the thanksgiving of his people. In the middle of the war, in the middle of the fight, in the middle of the tribulations, lift up your eyes to the hills and instead of complaining, murmuring and your wailing, lift up a song of adoration and thanksgiving to God and watch him move into action. Many times in my life, I have found myself in the midst of situations and challenges that defy even my understanding in the first place. I couldn't even make out what the issues were, talking more than looking for solutions. In the middle of that confusion and initial panic, I tune my heart to thanksgiving. And before I know it, the same issues that I couldn't fathom either become clearer for me to deal with or more times than not, the challenges and challengers just dissipate the same way they came. Have you considered what the Bible says about how to thank God? There are different ways and manners in which you can go about the thanksgiving of God. In the Bible days, people thanked God with animal sacrifices and burnt offerings. You can thank God with your giving to the poor to the work of God and to his servants. You can thank God through worship, songs, writings, and poems, like King David and King Solomon did in the book of Psalms and the Songs of Solomon. You can thank God in dances and any expression of thanks to him. But how exactly should you carry out these manners of thanksgiving? In the spirit and in the truth, there is a generally accepted guideline on how to thank God and reverence Him. And Jesus communicated that in the book of John, chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. He said, But the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Have you realized that sometimes you're so encumbered with life's many activities that you ignore very important 
yet minute details. And yes, trust me, this cuts across the entire scope of life, including our relationships. You see, patience helps us take God and follow His lead each step of the way. Many times we fail to be patient with God, and so we miss the little hints He gives us regarding very important aspects of our lives. You see, your Heavenly Father is interested in every aspect of your life. And He not only works on you, He works for you, through the lives of those He'd bring across your path in life. Remember that the Bible says that all things work together for the good to them that love God, who are called according to His purpose. Part of God's goodness to you at one point or the other will be to bring some people into your life. An example is Adam. God had created Adam and given him everything he'd need to flourish in the garden. Yet God noticed that something was missing. Though Adam never complained, God knew he was lonely and set forth to do something about it. The Bible says this thereafter, Genesis 2, 20-23. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that was how God's move brought value to man's life by adding a woman. Just like Eve, God will bring one or two more people into your life in order for you to fulfill your destiny better. You don't want to miss this very important detail of the right people in your life because of your pursuits in life. Relationships matter in your destiny and in your walk with God. And because the enemy can also send people into your lives, God has helped us to put together in patterns to recognize if we're in His will with someone or if someone shouldn't be in our lives. Remember that the Word of God says evil communication corrupts good morals. This kind of influential communication is the product of relationship and association. You see why God might focus and take keen interest in the kind of associations you make and the kind of people you're connected with? God also knows that women would need to marry a man someday, and likewise the men as well. So beyond just emotional triggers or connections, here are some things you should look out for in order to know if God wants you to be with someone. When God wants you to be with someone, He does these things. One orders your steps and the other person's. We don't often draw sense out of things like this, but it's very true. God does it a lot. It'll always appear like a coincidence and unplanned. However, to the Creator, it is predestined. God creates atmosphere and circumstances for us to be with the person He wants us to be with. And if we don't consider those circumstances, we may grumble when we should be at peace and we will hasten out of something God is putting in place for our own good. The Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. When God wants you to be with someone, He orchestrates a connection, sometimes even an impossible one. Imagine the kind of friendship that David and Jonathan had, then consider how they crossed each other's path. Consider the relationship Isaac had with his wife, and then consider how after Abraham's servant had prayed, how God had moved Rebecca to be at the right place at the right time. This is very important to note. You don't have to walk on the streets looking for who should and shouldn't be in your life. You're human and you'll miss it because you'll be deceived by external demonstrations of goodness by ravaging wolves in sheep's clothing. However, if you prayed about it and trusted God to give you the right person, then you go about your business in line with God's will you allow God to do what only He can do, which is see beyond the outside and into the hearts of men. 1 Samuel 16, 7 But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. 
The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's therefore safer for you to let God make this happen for you than making it happen for yourself so that you don't become a victim of circumstances. Two, they will fit into the working of God in your life. I want you to understand that every believer is a work of God in progress, a great destiny in the making. Sometimes your association or relationships with a person might prove useful or detrimental to that work that God intends to do in you. One of the ways to know that God doesn't want someone in your life or a person's not meant to be with you is they won't fit into God's purpose for your life. Listen carefully. This can happen even if they're believers. You see, because God has different purposes for us, one person may be destined for a different place, time, or activity, while you're destined for another. Trying to force yourself into each other's life could be like forcing a wrong piece of the puzzle into place. It can never work. In fact, such relationships turn into burdens instead of relief. You see, this is why it's beyond emotional attachments. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we live by faith, not by sight. What does this mean? It means we're not driven by our heads or how we feel, but by faith. Faith being our agreement and alignment with God's Word and Spirit. My friend, sometimes the thing you call love or passion is just emotional infatuation that'll be watered down over the years and under adverse circumstances, unless it's inspired by God's hand. It takes two to make a relationship work. And in order for that to happen, one person makes it easier for you to fit in. And you find it easy to settle peacefully. Hence, it becomes a confirmation that God wants them in your life. 3. Your relationship will thrive more, even in crises. One of the signs that a person isn't meant to be in your life is that they'll not be willing to bear under pressure with you for long. Now, please understand me. There are certain pressures that can happen in a person's life that'll cause them to chase away good things and good people from them. Such casual attitude could be toxic and traumatic to whoever's in the relationship with such a one. This normally would not be a problem if the person in question makes an effort to change and are willing to admit they hurt others. However, one cannot thrive in a relationship that's abusive and toxic. In fact, such deprecation in a relationship crises might be God's sign that a person shouldn't be in your life and vice versa. What does the Bible say about the kind of person he wants his children to be associated with? 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? In other words, because you and an unbeliever are influenced by different spirits and because of God's holiness, He would not want you involved with an unbeliever, especially one whose lifestyle grieves the Spirit of God within you. However, when you observe that instead of breaking apart, you're both drawn back together in the bond of peace and the spirit of unity, you'll know that God wants you to be with this person. I want you to remember that intimate relationships, especially marital relationships, must involve crises at one point or another. This is an established fact. Hence, when things meant to break you apart strengthens your bond, then God wants you to be together. Four. This person is interested in committing to you and helping you become who God wants you to be. Although it's true that you can't marry everyone who commits themselves to contribute to your growth, it's also true that the person God wants you to be with will have this quality more than anyone else in your life. Take note that I said that they'd be willing to commit in helping you become and fulfill God's purpose for your destiny intentionally. I say this because it's not just about the commitment, but about God's will and your place in it. The person God wants you to be with will be an extra nudge in God's direction. Not in your own way or the way of the world, but in God's own way. That means they won't encourage you to have sex with them before marriage. It means that they'll value holiness above the desires of the flesh. It means that they'll be willing to pay the price and go the extra mile for you. Believe me when I tell you, 
that we are all a work in progress. And God's purpose for our intimate relationships is not just for you not to be lonely, but also for you to grow in His grace together. And in order for this to happen, there must be sacrifices from both sides. One who isn't willing to make sacrifices for you, especially in line with God's will, may not be the right person for you to build a life with. The popular verse of John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The true signs of love and commitment is sacrifice. This sacrifice would involve making you their priority and vice versa. It would involve praying for each other, fasting for each other. It would also involve being patient, even when we seem not to understand certain things. My dear friend, the kind of individual you'll end up with will go a long way in affecting God's purpose for you. This is why you need to understand that God must take the lead in helping you find and commit to them. They may not look like it, but if you have a genuine and submissive relationship with God, it becomes easier for Him to either place or remove people from your life. This is why I encourage you to commit in growing in your walk with God and thus building your spiritual senses. Once that's done, it becomes easier for you to recognize the kind of person He wants in your life and the kind of people He may not want for you. God bless you and impact you with discernment as you journey to discover who He wants you to be with.